Well, good afternoon. I think it's almost afternoon anyway. I want to welcome you today as we come for worship and um, an opportunity as we have through this season to focus in, to be a little bit more intentional about who we are as followers of Jesus. And so grateful for you coming out and being a part of this. We're going to talk some about our speaker. Some of it will even be true. Introduce him in a few minutes. Um, But as we come, would you uh, join us as we pray together? Lord, as we pause, it is that we would simply give you room to move into our hearts and our minds and our lives this afternoon because we, Lord, as always, need more of you. And so we invite you to speak to us today um, as we come in worship that we would offer you our hearts as well as our minds and that all that we do would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. All this we pray in the name and spirit of Jesus and all God's children said, amen. Well, we have a treat today. At least I think it's a treat. I hope you will think it's a treat. If not, don't burst my bubble. But it is what I think is the best hymn in the English language that's ever been written. It happened to have been written by a guy named Charles Wesley. And uh, you might remember hearing something about his brother. And it is number 363, and can it be that I should gain? See if you can figure out what's my favorite verse. So 363, and can it be that I should gain? By the way, let me say real quick, David uh, Bellows is out sick today. He did record um, our accompaniment, so we don't have to suffer through me leading a cappella. Um, so anyway, uh, Dennis will give that to us here in just a moment. But I'm going to invite you, if you would, to stand. Number 363.
So did you figure out what's my favorite verse? Verse 4. You got it. Whoever said that. Um, Jay Mumper uh, has been worshiping with us for about two, three years. How long has it been? Close to three. Um, is a retired, uh, and I said that exactly right, retired, not some other word, retired Presbyterian pastor, um, uh, have, was ordained in 1989. Prior to that, I know he has served in the U.S. Army, um, has held a number of different jobs. I've joked with him that he can't keep a job until he went into the ministry, and you know anybody can keep that one. Um, but he has been a music director, organist, keyboardist, Christian educator. Um, I, I'm sure I missed something else as well as husband and dad and grandfather and, um, and has become a friend. And have gotten to, to know and enjoy Jay, um, appreciate his sense of humor most of the time. Um, it, uh, sometime back, he and I were, we, we had this text thread between Pastor Bob and Jay and myself, and, and we were giving Bob a hard time. None of what we were telling him was true, but we had him going. And so it's one of my favorite moments in ministry, and so just anyway, it's been, been fun to do that. And so, um, Jay, come and share with us what God has laid on your heart for us today, and we are glad to have you as friend and brother in Christ and servant of the Word with us this afternoon. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Uh, he needs a Presbyterian to keep his theology straight. <laughs> Next week will be the rebuttal for everything he says this week. So. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> I always like to tell the story about whenever I was uh, going through the ordination exams, and the ordination exams, probably like with Methodists, but in the Presbyterian Church, they're, they're noted of being very, very difficult. And I remember when the, the very last question they asked me, spell Presbyterian. And I went, you know, could I have a little bit of time on that? Uh, maybe a cup of coffee or something like that? I'm glad I wasn't uh, Episcopal. Can you imagine that, Michael, spelling that? Of course... Methodist Episcopal churches. How does that work? But anyway, it's good to be with you today. It's nice seeing you. Today we're going to, uh, uh, well, you'll find out here just in a moment. And last week, uh, Brother Earl gave a great message. Really enjoyed that. He, in fact, he used an acronym for prayer. Uh, Brother Mike likes to use the Lord's Prayer as his leading in whatever he stands up. If I had him, Mike, why don't you go ahead and stand up and pray for us? He would have that in the back of his mind. Well, Brother Earl had an acronym, which is A-C-T-S, ACTS. And A stands for adoration. That's how you adore God. And then C for confession. T for thanksgiving. And S for supplication. But what he asked that during our time of Lent is to... Take the last one, supplication, in other words, asking God for all these things that we, we need and we want and all that, but to scratch that and stop at Thanksgiving. So how, I was working on this. What a different aspect. It's like over in Ukraine. I'm going, well, Lord, would you? No, no, no. It was, Lord, thank you for the Christians who are there and give them even more strength because you know now the, uh, the citizens of Ukraine and even of Poland, they are praying more than what we could ever think of praying. And those who might have been just kind of a little bit wishy-washy in their faith are probably reaching out. And those people may say, I really don't know the word that well, but now the Holy Spirit is working through them. So you know as Christians there are great things happening over there in the midst of all this turmoil and devastation so we still pray for them, but we give thanks to God. So I thought that was really good what Earl presented last week. And then he also said that, for, I didn't get all of them down, but uh, he said when we pray, we may want to go ahead and take a walk. Remember that? Just walk. Walk somewhere. Be thinking prayer. Prayer isn't something that, that you have to have these and thous and everything. So he was uh, speaking about prayer. And that's a little bit of review if you weren't here last week. So Earl's a teacher. Please, uh, is Earl here? Anyway, you just tell him that uh, as a substitute teacher, I reviewed his, his stuff. So anyway. But today, I want us to think about taking a walk. And we're going to walk through 
the scriptures, not all of them, during this Lenten season. And the key person that I want us to dwell on, and we often think of this person during Lent, especially on Good Friday, we think of him. And we kind of leave it go. And it's the, the apostle Peter. Let's talk about Peter. When I was reading the scriptures, and this some time ago, in fact, it was a, a sermon that Pastor Mike brought up, whatever, but it stimulated my thoughts about, about Peter. And... You know, we, I think we realize that Peter was a rough, gruff type of person, very calloused hands. He was a fisherman. He was a businessman. He and his brothers, and probably quite successful. And Jesus had to mold, of course, all, not just uh, Peter, but all the rest of them into future apostles, ones who were going to be sent out. They didn't know that. In fact, there was a time where when Jesus chose Peter, he said, I'm going to make you what? Fishers, I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. Here's our choir. Where's David? So that, that was very good. Very <laughs> Rehearsal is uh, tomorrow night. Okay. Anyway, so fishers of men. I'm sure Peter went, if he was like us, he probably went, I don't know what that means, but I'm going to follow this man because he believes in me, and I, I hear him. I'm going to follow him, whatever that is. And eventually, we know or we see in the scriptures that he did become a fisherman of, of men, of women. He's also a man who walked on the water. We always think of Jesus, but of course Jesus did, but Peter did too. He was the first one out of the boat. I guess you have to get out of the boat, don't you, Pastor Mike? You see, who wrote that book? You have to get out of the boat to walk on the water. Yeah, John uh, Orberg from Malin in California wrote, in order to walk on the water, you have to get out of the boat. And Peter was the first one out. Well, we know that he started going down because he looked at the waves and his faith started going. And Jesus, of course, did what? Reached down, picked him up. But he walked on, on the water. And he was also a man who deeply loved Jesus. It's about three, I think three weeks ago that Pastor Mike preached a sermon. And at the end, there were a couple of things that he said just pierced my heart. And one of them was to think. We need to think like Jesus. He didn't say we need to act like Jesus. You can't act unless you think like Jesus. And then to go deeply into Jesus. It's like having a relationship with your spouse where you love your spouse. You know, it, it can be a, a love and <clears throat> type of relationship, but you, you love deeply or a significant other or someone. You, know, you love them deeply. And Peter loved Jesus deeply. And that was going to be put to a test. And then at the transfiguration, I love Peter. So Jesus invites Peter, James, John. They go up to the mountain where Jesus is speaking with Elijah and Moses. And of course, what do the boys do? They're tired. What about Jesus? Is he not tired? No, because he's. And th so they fall asleep. And when they come back, you can imagine Peter just saw enough of it. They wake up and he said, I, Let's build three tents. Okay, I, I can do that. I'm a fisherman. Let's build three tents and one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So, so what do you think? Good? Uh, you still were sleeping, Peter. That's all there was to it. No, that's not what it was about. And then near the end, close to the Passover meal, it was Peter and John that Jesus gave the directive to when they were going into Jerusalem for the last time. And the apostles did not know this. But that Jesus said to Peter and John, I want you to go and prepare the Passover for us. And they did. And it's kind of interesting. At the Last Supper, we know this is the first time communion was really served, where Jesus said, this bread is my body which is given for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant given for you in my blood. And every time that you eat the bread and drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. And you're going, and we, we understand because we have communion once a month, some churches every week. But look what happened immediately following that wonderful time of Jesus. And we have pictures of it, you know, at least renditions of, of the Last Supper. What do they do? They get in an argument. Is it a family reunion or what? It's, they get in an argument over who's the greatest. Can you believe that? There's Jesus. He just revealed himself again to them. And they're going, who's the greatest? And Jesus had a moment with them you know, about, about this. And this is when Jesus really confronted Peter. And I believe when Peter became a man of God was when this happened. Let us pray. Lord, I pray for the Holy Spirit to guide these scriptures today. In Jesus' name, amen. I brought out of the archives of my life a Bible that went to me It was when I graduated. And from high school, the good news for modern men, it was everywhere. I thought, for some reason, I wanted to read it. And so we're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 22, starting in actually 30, 31, and it's going to be 31 through 33. And this is when Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Now, okay, they're arguing about this, and Jesus pulls Peter off to the side, and look how he addresses him as Simon, Simon. My middle name is Robert, so I'm J. Robert Mumper. So if I ever heard J. Robert, now, you know, now didn't mean in a little while. And same way with all of you. I am sure when your middle name was used that this would happen. Okay, so this is what he says to him. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has received permission, permission to test all of you. As a farmer separates wheat from the chaff, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. And when you turn back to me, can you imagine Peter hearing this? And when you turn back to me, what is he saying to me? Where am I going? What do you mean turning back? What does he know? And when you turn back to me, you must strengthen your brothers. What is this? Peter answered, Lord, I am ready to go to prison with you and to die for you. He's willing. Today we would say, I'm willing to take the bullet for you. I'm willing to do that. Isn't it? What man he is. He's willing to do that. Hmm. But Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me. How many times? Three times, three times. And then things started happening. Jesus was arrested. How many times does Jesus have to say our names to get our attention spiritually? How many times do he has to say, Jay Robert, you pay attention, you go deep into my life. Start thinking the way that I think. Read those scriptures. If we go on, then we see in chapter 22, verses 54 through 62. I'm going to read this also. This is good news for modern man. They arrested Jesus and took him away into the house of the high priest. And Peter followed far behind. Notice. Keep this in mind. This is his Lord. He's going to die for him. And where is he? Far behind. He's at a distance. I think the NIV has and other. He's at a distance. He is far behind. Wait, what is he doing? He's cowering, isn't he? Staying away. A fire had been lit in the center of the courtyard. And Peter joined those who were sitting around it. Who were these people that he was joining? Were they his fellow Followers? 
No, no. Strangers, right? When one of the servant girls saw him sitting there at the fire, she looked straight at him and said this. Hey, this man, this man too was with him, with, with Jesus. He, he was there. Peter denied it. Woman, I don't even know him. I don't even know him. Look at the magnitude of this. This is the man who's going to take the bullet. He's going to go to prison, take the sword, be beheaded, whatever it would take for his Lord. I want to mention something real quick. I've put myself in Peter's place. And I'm thinking, would you be strong enough to be with Mary, the mother, Mary Magdalene, along the road? Or would you be with Peter going, you know what? I, I don't know him. Hmm. I pray not. And after a little while, a man noticed him and said, you are one of them too. You are. You're one of them. Peter answered, man, I am not. And about an hour later, another man insisted strongly, there isn't any doubt that this man was with him because he also is a Galilean. Right there. I mean, three people, three witnesses, eyewitnesses to Peter and his relationship with Jesus. But Peter answered, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And at once, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. But that's not what turned The crowing of a rooster did not turn Peter's heart. It's the next part. The Lord turned around. Some movies, I think you'll see the Lord just looking up. But it says, all the scriptures say, the Lord turned around and looked straight at Peter. Remember mom and dad sometimes with you, possibly, or someone, a loved one. Look you square in the eye after you've denied something and, and you melt. The Lord turned around and looked straight at Peter. As we are being cleansed, Pastor Mike talked about this Lenten season is a time of spiritual cleansing. How often does the Lord look at us? How often do we allow him to look at us and we not, no, 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 that. That, that can't be. You know, the best thing to do is not even read the scriptures. If I don't read the Bible, then I'm not liable for it, right? So if I stay away from the Bible, then I wouldn't get... Eh, uh, that's, that's not how that works. The Holy Spirit draws us into the scriptures. And when the Bible or a sermon or it could be almost a thought, the Holy Spirit is in us, working in us. So when Jesus looks us straight in the eye, then how will we respond? And Peter remembered the Lord's words, how he had said, Before the rooster crows today, you will say three times that you do not know me. And this, I believe, this is when Peter turned to be the man of God that he died for. That Jesus died for him, and Peter died for Jesus later in his life. Peter went out and wept bitterly. Somewhere, sometime in your life, you have probably wept bitterly. It could have been a loss of someone. Or something that you found out even about yourself. You wept bitterly. I was in the music department at college... I was getting into my locker, never forget it, had it opened up, had one foot in, and down, come, down the steps comes this uh, a fellow student, I really forget his name, I think it was Larry, and Larry came, he was a trumpet major, <laughs> I was a music major, he, and he was a trumpet major, Larry was a no frills person, he was straight, he practiced all the time in the uh, practice room, and never kidded around, this was just Larry. He came up to me and said, Jay, your room is on fire. And he walked. 
Knowing, the con, knowing him, I immediately shut that door. I walked down. I walked up three steps, turned left, went out the double doors. I looked out. Uh, I was in a college in West Virginia, so there's, there's no flat places. It's either up or down. So I was up. I looked down. There's the, the dorm, which was a relatively new dorm. Smoke was coming out of the third floor. And there were fire trucks, firemen, and... I sat down, I wept because I knew as a Christian I was not doing what Jesus wanted me to be doing. I had made wrong decisions and he loved me so much and I believe that he used this for me to be broken before him. I took that long walk down the hill and went all these fire hoses and everything and I saw this fireman. He was an older guy. Probably at that time, he could have been in his 40s. Can you imagine? I mean, ancient. And he had a white hat, fireman's hat on. So I knew enough to go to him. He said, why don't you come with me? And so we went up the steps. But it's not so much the, the fire. is the fact that God gives us opportunities. God wasn't finished with me yet. In seminary. We're always pure, aren't we? Always everything that we think about in seminary. I had an evening course. I pulled up into the parking lot in my Datsun 210 leaking oil, and the door never shut. I had to sit on a, uh, a belt to keep the door shut. Welcome to seminary. And a fellow student and I, we were walking in, and I was, to tell you the truth, I was gossiping about someone. I was. Walked into the hallway, you know, the stairwells, and the stairwells, as you know, you can just whisper something and it goes up. When I was saying something, the door up a couple floors opened up just, and there was another class that was released. And this fellow student, he came down, and I was going up with my friend, and he stopped. He looked me straight in the eye and said, that is not appropriate. Why would I remember that today? Because the Lord is, he does this to bring us closer to him. He did this with Peter to bring him close. Jesus knew that he would turn around. He said, when you turn around, when your life is turned around, then. This is brokenness, by the way. This is being broken before the Lord. He was wept. He, he wept, and he was sorry. And where did Peter go from there? He went, and he joined the others somewhere. We don't hear him going up to the cross. But what was significant about this? I'll look at the cross up here. Oftentimes, so Peter came... And he wept, and we, are, we hear that we, we leave our burdens at the cross. Isn't that true? We put our burdens down at the cross. And what Peter did and what Jesus wants us to do, he wants us to continue on. Now that I have bled for you, I have covered those, they are now, you are pure, and go on. So you keep on going on, and you walk towards, see that stained glass window over here? This one right there. See the crown? So we're heading towards the crown of Christ. Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords. And our life is, Peter was heading towards the king of kings and lord of lords. He continued on. He believed in the resurrected Jesus. Even though it hadn't quite happened yet. But he was heading, he did not leave it here. And oftentimes, we leave our burdens at the cross. But then... Satan goes, yo, <laughs> whoa, yo, you forgot something. You, you for, uh, don't you remember? Hey, Pete, remember the three denials? Don't you know this? It's like, I am going this way. I am heading out this way. Come on, Pete. Come on. You can trust me. Remember Adam and Eve? <clears throat> yeah, I do remember Adam and Eve and what you did there. And so you go on. And this happens with us that Satan will want to come, and he wants to destroy what we have because he's a liar. We are forgiven. He was forgiven. And on it goes. What I appreciate about 
appreciated about Peter, he went on and he joined the others. I don't know what he said to them. I don't even know if he confessed to them. I really don't. We don't know that for sure. So he goes. And he left these things behind like we must. When we are cleansed by the Holy Spirit and we sin, remember Satan is like a roaring lion. In fact, let's go to a, a letter that Peter wrote. <clears throat> in fact, one of the, the greatest sermons, by the way, is in chapter 2 of Acts. Probably one of the greatest sermons in the whole New Testament is this rough, gruff, sinner, denier, sleeper, who wrote, he had the first sermon on that day of Pentecost. How the Holy Spirit filled him, fills us, fills you. And he wrote this. Chapter 5 of 1 Peter, verse 8 through 11. Be alert, be on watch. For your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion. Looking for someone to devour. Who's he going to devour? Is he going to devour a... a person who is strong in the Lord? See, no, he's going to, no. During the, I tell you, during this Lenten season, a lot of things are coming up, and, you know, we could even say, I'm not even sure if I'm a Christian. I don't even know that. Satan's going, that's because you're not. Did you read your Bible today? Did you pray at noon when Rosie wants us to pray at noon? Uh, you didn't, so therefore... We're not sure about your... That's what Satan wants to get in those little cracks and crevices in our life. Be firm in your faith and resist him. For you know that your fellow believers in all the world are going through the same kind of sufferings. Keep this in mind for today. But after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who calls you to share his eternal glory in union with Christ will himself perfect you and give you firmness strength, and a sure foundation. To him be the power forever and ever. So when Jesus is calling you and your eyes are there and Satan is behind you, I'll tell you what you can do. I was going for a walk, right? This was in Chesapeake, Virginia, early in the morning. And I'm walking, and out of nowhere came a Rottweiler on full run right towards me. All I knew to do, I turned around to say he was coming this way, and I went, stop. He stopped. I went, sit. And he went down. I went, stay. And I go, <laughs> don't. I'm going, do not look him in the eye. Don't look him in the eye. Just kind of, I have no idea whatever happened to the dog. But that is one thing that when Satan starts coming after us, is that we can say, stop it, Satan. I'm a child of Jesus Christ. I am saved by the blood of Jesus. You have no business with me. Out of here. Amen. So that's what you do. I thought it was uh, Kenneth Copeland. Uh, who said that, uh, no, Hagen, who said that once he, he and his wife, they were sleeping upstairs. He heard this commotion downstairs. He walked downstairs. Sitting in his chair was uh, a rendish of, of Satan with the goat head on. And he looked at him and went, oh, it's you. And walked now upstairs. <laughs> Gave no credence to him at all. So that is what we do. And it says here in these scriptures again. But after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all, aid, uh, uh, of all grace, who calls you to share his eternal glory in union with Christ, will himself perfect you and give you firmness, give you strength and a sure foundation. He's the king. To him be the power forever and ever and ever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Him, our hymn is number 365, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Yonder on Calvary's mountain. 
Next week, Lesson Wanda Wilson will be sharing the message together as the word that I have. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and they're pastors from Ohio and, and spend the winters here with us. And so we look forward to having them come share God's word. Would you receive this blessing? And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you forever. Go in peace. And all God's children said... Amen. Amen.